On the KPBS Roundtable today, did Mayor Filner shake down Sunrose Enterprises? What about City Council's role in giving the developer a break in the first place? And the feud between the Mayor and City Attorney Jan Goldsmith heats up after Filner boots Goldsmith's deputy from a meeting. Plus, Goldsmith becomes a figure of fun nationally for his office's prosecution of a man criticizing a bank using water-soluble chalk. I'm Mark Sauer, and the KPBS Roundtable starts now. Joining me at KPBS, KPBS Roundtable today are Dave Rowland, editor of San Diego City Beat, Dorian Hargrove of the San Diego Reader, and Tony Perry, San Diego Bureau Chief of the Los Angeles Times. Let's start with what some have called a shakedown of, by Mayor Bob Filner of the developer Sunrose Enterprises. At issue is a $100,000 payment by Sunroad to the mayor's office. Sunroad wanted to get easements on public land adjacent to a project that it's building in Kearney Mesa. The keywords most media have focused on are Filner, $100,000, developer, gift, investigation. But the story is far more complicated and nuanced. Uh, Dave Rowland, you and City Beat offered a, uh, a, a pretty thorough look at the, uh, what you call the holistic uh, view of mm -hmm. this whole thing. Uh, start us at the beginning. What is, uh, what is this all about and why did you call it uh, in, in quotes a shakedown, not really a shakedown perhaps? Well, yeah, that, that's just the, the term that, that's being thrown around and so that's just the term that I use to uh, you know, start the conversation, I guess. We've put it in quotes because we're not really sure uh, what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, it was either a donation uh, from a developer to uh, uh, out of the goodness of its heart to, uh, to the city of San Diego. Uh, the mayor or characterized it, it that. Yeah, or it was uh, a direct payment for uh, uh, favorable action uh, by by the mayor, and it it started. I guess I'm not sure where you want to where you want to begin, <laughs> it's but complicated. it could begin with something uh, called I think it's called a permit permit plan check, a, a bureaucratic step in a, in a development process where they make sure that you know all the all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. Um, the way so we should say this is a residential complex they're building there in Kearney Mesa and they had built the first phase, right? So they were asking, they had a problem with the second phase. They wanted to encroach on this park a little bit, Well, there's bit, right? two, yeah, right now under construction, uh, just starting construction, there are two large apartment buildings on either side of a two-acre park mm -hmm. called Centrum Park. Okay. Uh, and so uh, they're to the north and, and the south. Uh, and and during this routine check of the permit, uh, Sun Road says it was discovered by city staff that they... Uh, that they needed 15 feet between each of these buildings and the park mm -hmm. for fire safety reasons. And that's state building code, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and they only had six feet on either side. Okay. And so Sun Road, for, for this thing to be legal stay, uh, from a state perspective, uh, uh, needed uh, more space, needed to encroach on the, pub the public park, which is public property. Mm -hmm. So they needed the city to give them permission and e nine foot easements to get that six feet to mm -hmm. 15 feet. So to get the permit and continue with construction, they needed to get the city to give them a little bit of land. Go ahead, yeah. Tony. Don't get me wrong. I'm an old firehouse dog. I love a good city hall scandal as, uh, as much as anybody else. But isn't this the kind of thing that happens every day? Mm -hmm. People who own property come in and say, hey, I'd like to do this or that. And city hall Request says, a variance, yeah. uh, property has rights, also has responsibilities. How about uh, donating to the school or setting back or building less uh, dense development? Yeah, isn't the problem this? is that that's usually handled on the front end. And this mm -hmm. was handled on the back end. Yes, and indeed. that is the problem. So, so, so we're in council member Lori Zaff's district there. There, and she uh, gets a call from the developer saying, hey, we've got this problem. Yeah, he wasn't getting any, any satisfaction from, the from the city staff, folks, yeah. from Parks and Rec or right. Development Services or wherever he was going. I think there were also some conversations early on, maybe back in March, early March, with the mayor's office. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't getting anywhere, so they went to the council member's office. Mm -hmm. And Lori Zaff is a pro-business, mm -hmm. uh, pro-development uh, council member. And so she basically took... The request, uh, there were, it was, the request was basically in two parts. It was grant this easement, which is essentially a gift pu of public property, sure. you know, 18 feet of public property, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, also to waive a council policy that would make this uh, mm -hmm. gift legal. Mm -hmm. well, David, uh, where, where is the mayor's good friend, the city attorney, in all of this? Did he look this over, or is this a problem that's come up because of the estrangement between those two worthies? Well, if a, if he looked it over, I'm not sure. And he looked it over later. I mean, certainly he issued a, a, a memo in June saying, you know, 
Springsteen's got a great line, nothing illegal, maybe a little bit funny, and uh, that <laughs> might he be focused, what's going on. He did focus on, on, on the donation aspect, the city mm-hmm. attorney yeah. did. He didn't right. focus on the actual giving away right. of the easement or the fact that that's what they're proposing. But again, was. as Dave says, that was toward the back end here. So mm-hmm. well, let's let's get back to the story here. So Lori's up. Normally, you would go to city staff, development services, and say, what's the operating ordinance here? Is the rules? They're asking for a variance. How does that work? Is there money change hands? But we got to her committee, and she didn't really do all of that. Yeah, the she? Land Use and Housing Committee, which she chairs, and also this is in uh, this is in her district, so it would make sense that she would bring sure. it if anybody's going to bring it forward. Sure. She brings it to her own committee, and there wasn't much. There was no staff present, mm-hmm. no city staff present to answer questions Here's or give rules. some feedback yeah. or talk about the rules and what you know you might want to ask for something in return if mm-hmm. you're going to give over public property. Uh, there was none of that. And uh, in fact, it was Sherry Leitner, uh, council member Sherry Leitner, who said, I would be delighted mm-hmm. to make the motion to give you this easement that you mm-hmm. that you want. They and were so, really bending over backwards right. for the developer. And so they did. And of course, that wasn't the final word. It had to go to the full mm-hmm. council. And when, and when it got there, the council said... Uh, the council says uh, unanimously, yeah, let's let's go ahead with this deal. It did, and it, but it was interesting. Marty Emerald uh, and David Alvarez were two people that were kind of questioning it a little bit, especially Marty Emerald, who said, uh, I don't like this giveaway of public land, and we ought to get something in return for mm-hmm. it. So she actually said directly to Tom Story, the vice president of development for Sun Road, mm-hmm. uh, you should go to the mayor's office and real estate asset, the mm-hmm. real estate assets department, and negotiate some kind of price. Talk about for, a deal. Yeah. yeah. And which is kind of what, kind then of what, what happened. happened. Yeah. yeah. So how do we get from there? The, and then the mayor had vetoed this, saying this isn't in the public interest. And then the story shifts where, geez, we're going to kind of sell the override of this veto or sell him going along with overriding the veto. And there's 100000 bucks that's going to come in, not to the mayor, to be sure. It didn't go into his pocket, yeah. but to a couple of pet projects that he had, a Veterans Memorial and a bike safety uh, event, right? Yeah, so what happened is uh, from Filner's, this is Filner's story, um, Tom Story from uh, Sun Road contacts the mayor's office. And I, and I think at this point he's talking to Alan Jones, who is the former, uh, at the, at then the deputy chief of staff for the mayor's office, mm-hmm. uh, and says, hey, look, I've, I've got the, the votes to the city council to votes to override a mayoral veto. Mm-hmm. This is in the bag. Mm-hmm. It's mine. But if we want to, if we, if you want to get something out of this, you know, to make it all, to make it square, to, you know, to make it better for the public, sure, uh, uh, we can do that, I suppose. And, uh, mm-hmm. and Bob Filner then says, basically, it turned into an offer for a donation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this, and from Alan Jones telling of the story, it was just $100,000 to the city's general fund, and mm-hmm. he had recommended that it be put to use somewhere in Kearney Mesa, close to the mm-hmm. development, so mm-hmm. that there was some sort of nexus between right. the two. Somehow, I don't know how this happened, but but basically Bob Filner turned it into, as you say, mm-hmm. uh, $100,000 for a couple of his pet That's projects. Project. What should he have done? I mean, what could we have, have done here uh, differently to to have made this a little more, you know, seamless. I mean, it, it seems to me like going through the actual process would have been probably the safest route to go. I mean, as far as if you're using city land, then, you know, you have to, unfortunately, you have to go through the real estate assets department and everything Bob, else. isn't it? I mean, Bob has uh, reached down and is doing all sorts of things that ought to be done at other levels, staff or council offices. Bob charges in and makes it bed better for all of us. I mean, this... And Bob could have had somebody staff that uh, land, use and, land use and this housing committee. It's the seventh committee. largest city in the country. Yeah. He's worrying about a little easement in a it, city park. Yeah, his yeah. office knew about knew that it was coming up to the council uh, council committee, uh, but he didn't staff it. But also, Lurie's app didn't make any right. effort to ask for city staff. All to, right, we're gonna we're gonna wrap it there. It's very complicated, and I'm sure <laughs> we haven't heard the end of the this story. Let's turn now to an, another story involving the mayor and city attorney Jan Goldsmith. If the seas have been rough lately for Bob Filner, the city attorney has been out there tossing about as well. The feud between the mayor and city attorney crested last week when the mayor objected to the presence of a deputy city attorney in a closed meeting. Uh, Dorian Hargrove, you wrote about uh, a detailed story in the reader play-by-play of this showdown. Uh, First of all, uh, why didn't Filner uh, want this attorney in? And tell us about uh, a little of their history. Well, it goes back to the, the tourism marketing district um, squabble that, you know, as far as funding goes. So Andrew Jones, which is the executive assistant to Jan Goldsmith, mm-hmm. um, was present at those meetings and apparently it didn't go good because mm-hmm. the following day or two days after one closed session meeting, 
uh, Mr. Jones came out and basically said that he was disrespected. Uh, at one point, he, he had mentioned that he was kind of ordered to the back of the room, mm-hmm. uh, likened it to, you know, the Rosa Parks back of the bus mm-hmm. uh, issue. Which is a sore issue with the mayor because he goes back to the civil rights movement in the 60s and takes great pride in that. So then, then comes the budget, and Mayor Filner proposes some cuts to the city attorney's office. At that time, there was uh, positions that were identified in his budget to be cut, and one of those was just happened to be the executive assistant, Andrew Jones. So at that, I think that was the, uh, you know, that, that was the... The kindling was in place for the <laughs> yes, flame here. So tell us, tell us about this particular closed session that, uh, that you were writing about. So there was a closed session meeting. And again, they have these closed sessions so they can talk freely about legal strategies and negotiations and lawsuits, et cetera. They're, yeah. they're, it's not keeping the public out. It's, it's part of how they operate. And it was on, it was on June 18th, and um, it, it got off to a rough start for Mayor Filner. So meeting starts at 9. He's not there. Uh, which, council is, pre- which is typical, by the way. <laughs> Bob doesn't show up for he anything to make an entrance. Yes, yeah. he does. Yes, he does. <laughs> he knows stagecraft. <laughs> so he was uh, Council President Todd Gloria started the meeting. One thing I'm not sure is why there is a court reporter present at the meeting. Uh, the executive assist- assistant city attorney, Andrew Jones, was also there. Mm-hmm. So Mayor Filner comes in and objects to, first of all, that the meeting was started without him because he was 30 seconds late, as he said in the transcript. And then he objects to Mr. Jones being present. So there goes, the, it becomes a back and forth, and ended up where Mayor Filner had, a, had a, uh, Mr. Jones escorted out of the, uh, out of the meeting. And mm-hmm. Goldsmith now says, none of these closed sessions until Bob learns to play well with others. And not harass his employees. So said that this week, yeah. what does that mean? That they can't? meet behind closed doors. Is that going to bring City Hall to a grinding halt? Or what? Well, I mean, as far as any lawsuits or any, you know, anything pressing, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, th- those those items have to be discussed. It's a good them. thing the labor negotiation, those labor deals are done because, you know, that's that all gets hashed out in closed yeah, session. With lawyers present. Well, let's talk about, as you noted, they had a court reporter there, so they released notes of this meeting, but they're redacted. That means, of course, some parts are, are blacked out. And that's where it starts getting getting really interesting, is that some of the, some of the statements, and this is just from council members and other people present were absent. And this was, from what you can tell by reading the transcript, all had to deal with this, you know, fiasco going on inside the closed session meeting. And so two days later, on June 20th, uh, City Attorney Jan Goldsmith releases these transcripts. Um, His office said it was in response to a public records request. Which I think all of us know, if, if you submit a public records request, you're, you're lucky to you're, get... You grow old a, waiting. <laughs> yes. And you're Boom, lucky to get a, a response they that they receive back. within two days. So. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, you know, eventually uh, Attorney Corey Briggs for San Diegans for Open Government filed a lawsuit. And in his lawsuit, he said hearing a response in two days is as, is as rare as seeing... Corey Briggs is calling. still trying to find mm-hmm. out how the police chief decided over the line isn't is a, isn't a, a bacchanal where <laughs> yes. drinking is going on? That's a whole different show. Whole different I think. Different. <laughs> I mean, so, they've, they've been stonewalling him on that for months. Yeah, yeah. Corey and Corey does like to throw wrenches into the machine. That he do. But Absolutely. and so you asked to have all of these, have you not? Uh, all of these notes released. So there have been not lawsuits. The edited version. So yeah. there have been lawsuits before, which say that basically, if portions of non-agenda items discussed on the closed session during the closed session meetings are released, then that means that all of those non-agenda discussions are also open to mm-hmm. be, you know, mm-hmm. to be viewed by the public. Mm-hmm. Um, city attorney disagrees. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's where it comes into where there's a legal argument there, because obviously this could be a Brown Act violation. Mm-hmm. Some at least can look at it like that. Which is the Open Records Act. In California. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, and as you said, so Corey Briggs, the attorney, is going to uh, take this up and file suit and try to get these released. Yeah, he filed suit already, mm-hmm. and, uh, and it's, it's in the works. All right, now, so Todd Gloria released a statement. He's, of course, the president of the city council on Wednesday. What did he say? Why is that important? So one of the reasons why, uh, I guess the response to to Briggs' uh, request for more of the closed session transcript from the city's attorney, city attorney's office was that it's got to be released by legislative authority, which would mean, obviously, a vote would have to be taken. Mm-hmm. I asked uh, Council President Gloria if any vote had been taken, and his office uh, deputy or the chief of staff for his office said that there has been no such vote mm-hmm. and that was that was it mm-hmm. so which would mean kind of brings into question how did the records get released in the first place if the city council did not vote on them mm-hmm. 
Now, uh, in terms of, of the council's role, are they commenting at all on this whole release of the edited version, not release the full version? Has anybody had you know anything to weigh in on? Because they were, was it, the, it was in the entire council, right, that was party to this closed-door meeting? Yeah, I mean, so far everyone's been pretty quiet about the whole thing. Uh, Gloria's response was really the only thing I've seen. I don't know if anyone else has asked anything of the other council members, but that's the only, you know, him being the council president as well is the one docketing items and probably would initiate the vote. Do you get the sense mm -hmm. the council members, maybe with the exception of Todd Gloria, do you get the sense that they're afraid of Bob Filner? I mean, afraid to oppose him, afraid to be in the same uh, room, afraid I, to have their name two or three paragraphs away from his in a controversial story? I think judging by some of the transcripts, you can see some of them that want to, uh, they're not afraid, they actually probably want to. No, and in, 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 <laughs> in fact, uh, okay. some council members like uh, Scott, Scott Sherman, Scott Sherman okay. Kevin Faulkner have been very, very vocal. A couple of Republicans don't mm -hmm. mind yes. going up. How about the Democrats? How are they? Well, Except I the think Democratic there are three, three Democrats on the council that are, that are allies with Bob Vilner and were, and, you know, before he was elected. And fill and, in line on the on not overriding the veto on the city attorney's uh, budget, right? Say again? They fell in line. They oh. The Democrats refused to back up the Republicans in overriding what uh, even Todd Gloria said was a punitive action in the mayor trying to cut the city attorney's budget. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, you've got people like Marty Emerald, David Alvarez, and Myrtle Cole, who's just been seated on, on city council. Uh, they can... Uh, well, let's see. You need uh, six votes to override a veto. Yeah, they so came, uh, they're, you know... Close, if they get one more vote and, you know. And actually, during the meeting, Scott Sherman walked out, and he was, uh, I don't have the exact quote, or I do, but I'd have to look at it. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he was pretty much appalled by what was going on. Mm -hmm. and well, so he's, he walked he's out making a little rep for himself as the anti filner mm -hmm. Yes, and but he's been also, doing it. It was also Kevin Faulkner, who I believe, who released the telephone uh, the voicemail from Tom Story on the Sunroad thing that we just talked oh, about. Right. Uh, so there's some real warfare that to the going media on. media that basically yes. makes Bob look bad. Yeah, there's some real palace intrigue going on here and how <laughs> things are dribbled out. And, and as you say, uh, I don't know, stepping back for a moment to that mysterious voicemail, I don't know how that gets to Kevin Faulkner's office when the council member involved was Lori Zaff. And again, all of a sudden that's out in the press. So I actually submitted a public records request for that. And that was that came back. I, I received it one day after the UT did. So apparently they, they got it in one day quicker. Um, yeah. <laughs> Coincidence, probably. Um, so I got the same message the next day from, and, and my public records request was to all city council members mm -hmm. if they had any correspondence with Tom Story or Sun Road. Mm -hmm. So that's, that was the response. I'm still waiting to hear Lori Zaff's um, response for that, which it, they said they'll get back today. It oh. does appear that, uh, I'm sorry, going back to the Sun Road, I know we were talking about that. Uh, you know, go ahead, your last segment, word on this. But uh, it does appear like some people are, are leaving trails, leaving yeah. breadcrumbs for, uh, for anybody who yeah. might be investigating Very to, good to point. take a look. All right, we're going to leave it there on this episode. We're going to turn to another involving our city attorney. So many controversies, so little time. We've covered Sun Road Gate, uh, Redact Gate, and now let's turn to Chalk Gate. <laughs> San Diego man named Jeff Olson is among the legions of Americans fed up with the antics of Bank of America. He decided to protest by repeatedly writing messages in water-soluble chalk in front of the bank's branches. Bank officials got upset. They leaned on the city attorney's office to do something. Tony Perry, uh, that's when the fun began. You wrote about this. Uh, why don't you start with what was he writing and, and where was he writing? I'll start this way. This is a Navy town. Navy has a very strong rule that it teaches officers, particularly uh, senior officers, you can delegate authority. You can never delegate responsibility. I don't think Jan Goldsmith had any idea this case, one of a hundred, hundreds, thousands mm -hmm. that moved through out of his office, uh, had any idea till it exploded. Mm -hmm. They filed uh, misdemeanor charges against Mr. Olson, uh, claiming that uh, he was a vandal. And they were backed up by uh, some videos, and they were backed up by laws that said even chalk messages on the uh, sidewalk can be construed as, uh, as graffiti. His messages were bad bank, bad bank, Bank of America, et cetera, et cetera. Kind of clever, mm -hmm. I suppose. He's from the Occupy San Diego uh, movement. And he fought. And once it got out, it just looked foolish, and it made Jan Goldsmith look foolish, yea, though he knew nothing about the case until it arrived in court. Well, well you got to wonder about that. I mean, is, is it, I mean, at least he's guilty of being tone deaf, as you say. Well, or... he's, he's a busy man, and they've got, what, 300 attorneys over there? Yeah. They're moving stuff through. It's let's make a deal time. They offered Mr. Olson the deal. Hey, 
plead out. Come on. Yeah, tell us about do, that deal. What did they offer him? Well, exactly? the second deal, there was, was the first deal that I guess was a little harsh. And then the second deal was, okay, plead out, please. We'll give you an infraction. Well, we'll give you a But a, he wanted to pay bucket. restitution to the bank, and they wanted $6,900. Now, let me stop right there. We've got plenty <laughs> of kids this summer, 17-year-olds out there, who'd like to take a hose and a little scrub brush. Yeah. And maybe go to a little water soluble chalk for twenty bucks. Well, how in the world does it take this bank sixty nine hundred dollars to well, clean Well, I think up they were sending a message. They were trying to send a message. Yo, uh, Mr. Protester, please uh, uh, go to someone else's bank. Uh, mm -hmm. And Olson wouldn't have anything of it, and uh, I suppose they could have bargained it down even further. But mm -hmm. they went to court, and the uh, mm -hmm. from what we can tell, the jurors looked at that and said, No, mm -hmm. no, no, I don't think so, uh, uh, and found him innocent, quickly innocent, and of course. The mayor had, uh, the old 1960s activists, had been calling this a stupid case, a waste of money. Uh, he even refused to abide by the uh, the judge's gag order. He said, I ain't going to be gagged. Mm -hmm. This is stupid, and I'm going to continue to say so. So score one in chalk, I guess, for the mayor <laughs> in this uh, this battle of the titans against the city Let attorney. Let me ask you a little something about, and, and you guys weigh in on this, on the uh, the gag order from Judge Howard Shore. <laughs> in a here. misdemeanor case. Yeah, he wanted to, <laughs> he being the the, uh, the defendant here, wanted to raise a First Amendment issue. He wanted to be a civil liberties case. I'm writing, I have the right to. to so that's the kind of thing you raise at here. sentencing time. Yeah. Yo, I did it. But really, uh, but, but how, the but angels the judge are on my would, side. Yeah, not only the judge does, would have none, none Not of only that. does the yeah. judge say, uh, we're not going to allow you to use the first, as invoke the First Amendment as, right. a, as part of your defense. Right. He muzzles everybody. He uh, does. He, I, you know, you I, can't talk about it. I think we can. Talk about it. I think this is in a different context. This would be called jury nullification. I mean, the man did leave these messages mm -hmm. on the sidewalk. There is law that says you that is graffiti. Mm -hmm. well, you can be mm -hmm. convicted. And mm -hmm. there was pictures of him doing this. Mm -hmm. And they said no. Yeah. Let's uh, fight again another day on something important. Mm -hmm. So. The jury had the last uh, last laugh on this, I think. Yeah. I wasn't and sure where this was going to go because I think it brings up some interesting issues. Like uh, somebody, um, you know, on Twitter, I saw <laughs> it might have been might have been uh, Kelly Davis from my office uh, who said something like, "Well, what if what if it was a uh, a restaurant?" Uh, writing mean messages about a rival restaurant in chalk in front. I mean, is that okay? There I mean, where is, does the, it, what's allowed? And what, uh, what? Slander and libel. Could mm -hmm. have been a civil suit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are laws. But yeah, this uh, made everybody... Yeah, yeah everybody, I think the jury basically says, come on. Yeah. Don't well, give us this. And this, this is issue crazy. goes back you know, I think quite if it had been something other than a bank, maybe. Yeah. 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 Maybe if it had been an old folks' home or uh, yeah. you know, Little Sisters and of the Poor or something. Banks are not real popular And especially Bank of America with a poor reputation, uh, hundreds of and, millions in fines they've paid. And as you pointed out, the bank contacted the city attorney, this great, big, enormous, rich bank, found time right. to call the city attorney's office of the city of San Diego right. about this case. We should well, let the really? audience speak because we <laughs> broke this story uh, <laughs> along with some others that we're we, talking about today. You know, it was interesting when you said the restitution, uh, during the testimony, uh, the vice president of global security for Bank of America actually said that it took seven or eight employees to, first of all, just report the fact that there was graffiti left outside on the sidewalk. And then they would have to call uh, a outfit in Santa Fe Springs to actually contract the work out. So they were saying basically it was two, anywhere from 200 to $500 for each, you know, what, three-foot chalk. So we can't get that kid out there with a hose and a scrub brush, huh? Yeah, no, they, they, they won't decided to go the very professional route. It seems route. to me they could have sent out a message to their mortgage holders. Hey, come on over, help us clean this off, and we'll refinance, uh, we'll ratchet down your mortgage you know, somehow. And, Let's and, just stay yeah, in yeah. your house. It might have been a win-win. A lot of the, there was a lot of questions as well, because Jeff Olson was also picketing before he decided to start drawing chalk uh, slogans. And this uh, vice president of global security actually had a run-in with Mr. Olson. And it was written about uh, by a stringer for the reader, David Batterson. And that went public, and I don't think that Mr. Freeman, the vice president of global security for Bank of America, really appreciated it. Now, the interesting thing is the Occupy San Diego folks who were busted, a whole bunch of them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the city attorney, from what I can tell, hasn't been real hard. No, they mm -hmm. just process these cases, plead out, oh, mm -hmm. let's not even worry about this one. So this one was sort of very atypical that they appeared to take this mm -hmm. hard nose. And I think that plays into the mayor's annoyance, the mayor being rather suspicious of large corporations. It plays into his annoyance that why did you decide to grind Mr. Uh, Olson into dust on this thing? Well, they did have a previous case where it was a Occupy activist. It, Mr. Olson wasn't really an part of the Occupy movement. He, you know, uh, agreed with it. And yeah, yeah. Um, there was a 18-year-old girl. Uh, her name was Anyata, something. 
And uh, she had actually written Occupy Wall Street uh, in the Civic Center mm -hmm. and filmed it, YouTube, and she got arrested. And she was in jail for three days. And they pressed charges. Uh, they offered her a plea deal uh, a few days before, and she denied it. She rejected it. Mm -hmm. And then the day before trial, they decided to dismiss all the, ch mm -hmm. all the charges. Um, the attorney for that case, Jeremy Warren, actually said that uh, City Attorney Goldsmith was very, very involved in all Occupy yeah. activism. Okay. All right, cases. we're going to have to to leave it there. That wraps up another <laughs> week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. And I'd like to thank my guests, Dave Rowland of San Diego City Beat, Dorian Hargrove of the San Diego Reader, and Tony Perry of the Los Angeles Times for joining me today. A reminder, all of these stories can be found on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Mark Sauer, Senior News Editor at KPBS. Thanks for joining us today at the Roundtable.